Well, hello, I'm Alistair Benn and you're watching Vision and Light. This is the 20th episode and we've got something really special for you today. There's myself, which is the least impressive thing about the whole thing. And then I'm joined by Adam Gibbs and Thomas Heaton. Thomas, Adam and myself have just spent nine or 10 days on Iceland uh, where we were shooting and just having a great time and really just having a, our own little trip. So this is an opportunity to kind of catch up discuss what we've been doing uh, and kind of talk about the current state of contemporary landscape photography and how COVID-19 is really going to change things because obviously travel restrictions are huge and it was only because we were tested when we got here that we're allowed to be here uh, and I think we're going to have to be locking ourselves down when we get back home again anyway. So anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Adam Gibbs and Mr. Thomas Heaton. So we've had quite an adventure really while we've been here uh adam you you haven't you're probably of the three of us you're probably the one who spent the least time on iceland yes uh i was here about six or seven years ago and then last year i came here for i was just here for a day <laughs> just on my way to greenland so, right. uh, and i've just done the usual you know southern section around the island but uh this time has been exceptional to get to explore areas that I had no clue that existed, so it would be great. And we got to spend time with Thor. Yeah, Thor's a great guy. He, I think Thor goes to prove or goes to show that there are so many advantages to having a local guide. Because, yeah, you can come to Iceland and it's so easy to do the classics, the iceberg beaches, Vic, the waterfalls. But really, if you want to get into some real rugged terrain, you need a guide because he, he was, man, he was driving on some roads I wouldn't go near. He's crossing rivers deeper than my chest <laughs> and uh, he, he has local knowledge uh, so yeah the, having Thor who was our well he wasn't officially our guide he was just a mate who happens right. to live here but he, he is a professional photo guide by trade and uh, man his services are invaluable I've just noticed you've still got black sand in your ear how I've had like <laughs> four showers it's still there the problem is, I need, a, I need an earbud or something. I even have a, a scrubby thing to scrub my ears. Ah, what can you do? We'll do this later. We'll do the we'll do the the Tom Heaton ear cleanse. Well. Yeah. <laughs> right. So something I noticed with Tom in particular was that you were shooting an off. Well, a you were shooting a lot with the Hasselblad. And secondly, you were shooting a lot of intimate scenes. There wasn't an awful lot of big, wide landscape photography going on from any of us, I don't think. Uh, is this a, this seems to be a shift that's in your nature at the moment. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest um, changes of my photography of, of the past 18 months, I suppose, is uh, away from, getting away from bigger landscapes and looking for more intimate scenes, simply because, um, you know, if you go to an area and shoot a 16 mil landscape, and that's uh, some, you know, from some places, that's about, that's it, that's your shot. Um, and I find that going in with a longer lens or just looking a bit closer means you can get images that are more unique to you um, and not so easily replicated. And also, it's not even that, you know, it's just what I find interesting. Um, and the work that I love to look at by other photographers, that style, you know, I, sh I shoot what I would look at myself, if that makes sense. So it's just naturally appeals to me. I don't, I brought a 10 to, 10 to something lens, a wide lens, <laughs> no, not wide lens. When you're not doing your gear videos, you're a bit big. Oh, I'm used to it, yeah. <laughs> I brought a wide angle lens, I didn't use it once. Um, I really just love the normal view. Mm. So 50 mil all the way up to sort of 200. And Adam, you know, you're, you're used to photographing in in, in forests and really confined spaces have you felt being in this sort of massive wide open landscape to be daunting or challenging or just inspiring um, and motivating yeah in some ways because it's uh you have to you have to, it's a different mindset uh i think the first couple of days i was having a bit of a hard time because you know you're rushing around and you're trying to get your bearings and you're trying to figure out okay what am i actually going to photograph I actually left a lot of the wide angle lenses uh, at home. I left, I left them at home because I purposely thought that I'd probably be shooting uh, more intimate scenes. And actually I, I bought a lens the day that I left for the X-T4 because right. I didn't have anything long. And then of course the, the uh, medium format camera that I have, the longest I have is a 200 millimeter, which is only what, 
105, yeah. which is an extremely long. So, um, yeah, I did. Uh, I was looking for trees, you know. That's not <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I love the challenge. I mean, it's funny, though, because uh, if you ask me where we went, I, ha I don't have a clue no. where we went. I'm the same. I mean, I know we went into the interior, but if someone said, well, where did you go? I yeah. Don't know. I don't Every time we asked Thor where we were, there was just some unpronounceable Icelandic name, <laughs> which none of us knew where we were. But I, but I love that. I really, I really enjoy that aspect of photography. That's the fun part for me, is just going somewhere and finding stuff, you know, to photograph. I think, I mean, I was trying to work out when was the last time I actually went and did something purely for myself you know, without either being on a workshop or scouting for somewhere. I mean, this is probably the first actual just hanging out with mates photo trip I've done in... Years, I think. A, many years. Maybe since the last time you and I were in a Cinnaboyne. So six so. years, maybe, was the last time. Without thinking about product or images or utility or, you know, that type of thing. How important do you think this is, Tom, for your own creativity, you know, to, to just be able to detach and, and immerse yourself? Yeah, it's incredibly important. I mean, I've been to many amazing locations, uh, usually with workshop groups, which, don't get me wrong, is fantastic, but you'll know yourself when you're with a workshop group. It's a bit more restrictive. You can't say, all right, guys, see you later. I'm going to go and explore this area for two hours. Um, but when you're by yourself, uh, not working with no goals, no targets, uh, you know, nobody else to look out for, you really can just start to look at things in a, in a different way. You can take more risks, I suppose. You can shoot things that might not necessarily turn out very well. Um, whereas if you, for example, going back to the workshop group, you can't really you know, have your clients start experimenting with locations that you've never been to before uh, that may not result in any good images. So yeah, having that freedom uh, is fantastic and it just allows you to relax a bit more and the creativity starts to flow. We had a laugh. Uh, yeah, we had a laugh. <laughs> it was great. It was good fun. I mean, how, did, how was it for your photography? Well, it was very last minute for me. It was, you know, I think it was a. I asked it, about three or four days before. It was maybe it was about five or six days before I was due to fly that that you said, you know, would you like to come? Um, and I had to buy a tent and a ground mat and a sleeping bag because all my stuff's in Lhasa. Uh, it was. It's been incredible. It, you know, going back to the COVID thing, it's changing so quickly now again. You know, every day we've been here, we've had 3 or 4G and it's been updating news and the, the, the rules that existed in Iceland when we arrived are different today. Uh, so, you know, it, Iceland's open at the moment, but there's no guarantee mm. it's going to be open in a month's time. It might not be. It, it very well might not be. Or, you know, more testing might be involved and things like that. In terms of my photography, I, I'm very much in a transitional phase where any pressure to to produce images that are societally acceptably conformist is more or less eroded now. You know, I, I feel very liberated and very free to just be able to shoot what I want, how I want, when I want, and and it's a very personal and introspective thing. But talking to you guys during the week it sounds like we're all in a very similar position now that we feel very little external pressure to produce images in a certain way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one thing I've begun to realize more and more over the years um, with my YouTube channel, which is basically the beating heart of everything I do. Um, do you have a channel? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've begun to realize is actually people don't judge my images. I mean, obviously, you get your trolls, right? But we'll forget about them. I'm talking about the, the real good people who watch my channel, the, the people who are committed to the channel. They're not actually that interested in the final image. And when I say interested, what I mean is if it's not to their taste, they don't think, oh, rubbish video. They just love to see the process. So being aware of that lifts the pressure. And it does mean that I don't have to shoot what's popular. Not that I've ever really done that, um, but I'm just so much more aware that now I, could, I can shoot whatever I want to shoot. People really appreciate that. And yeah, if they don't like the images, they'll, they'll become a healthy debate in the comments, which is great. And some people do love the images and, and it opens people's eyes to what else is out there other than the wide angle view from the viewing platform, you know? Um, so yeah, just having, having that pressure lifted is, uh, it's nice. And I think it's important 
not to care too much about what other people think. Right. It's very helpful with creativity and mindfulness and relaxation and everything. I remember a couple of years ago when you won International Landscape Photographer of the Year, it, there was a, it was a popular decision, I think. You know, it was, it was popular within the, pho- the photographic community, the fact that it wasn't a wide-angle, dramatic light, compositing, right. glory light sort of photographer that had won again. Um, you know, and I think that sort of quiet light approach that you've immersed yourself in, you know, I don't know what you guys think, but it seems to me as if there's a general shift now towards small scenes, intimate scenes, less dramatic scenes, more simple processing. Um, and it's almost as if it's turned out, it's turning from an external validation pastime to an internal sort of self-actualizing process. Yeah, I, well, I think there's a lot more photography becoming a bit more mature in their craft, if you want to call it that. You know, these, everybody starts off with wanting to photograph what everybody else is photographing, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Why do you think that is? Well, because everything's epic, I mean, epic light. I mean, I've met a few people that they, they're just chasing the image all the time, but they, they ultimately end up giving up photography because it's just so much of a challenge to come up with those images. And then and they also realize that uh, a lot of it isn't to do with actual photography taking the photograph, it's all the processing afterwards which a lot of people aren't really into they want to just be outside I mean I've met so many people that um, they have images that they've taken three or four years ago and they still haven't processed them so it's pretty obvious to me that they just love the process of actually Being taking out there making the images rather than um, so I think maybe a lot of people start to mature and there's something go past the the, the usual photographs that you see and just trying to find their own voice or own path towards something a bit more meaningful f- for them. Both of you in the last year have published books. Yeah, mine's available now, thomasheaton.co.uk forward slash book. Well, I have them, but I, I haven't got your book. You haven't got mine yet. Where, where is it? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll buy one in the in the when it's the second edition. I'll buy one. Yeah, when's it available? So I need to buy one. Uh, my also. book, uh, it, it's uh, been printed. I think they had some problems with the images printing press. <laughs> <laughs> Content. Uh, to go to Getty to get. But some. it should be out. It should be out by the, uh, now. Actually, it should be out now. All right. Yeah. I'll so buy a copy. Um, yeah. Well, I've printed a thousand this time, so there should okay. be a few left. You can sign my breasts and then I'll press the book against well, my chest. Well, unfortunately, I can't sign them because the printer is in the UK yeah. and I'm in Canada, so it's kind of hard to, you know, it's just it'd end up too, too expensive for him to send them to me. And then yeah. Sign them. yeah. You did some signed editions, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> no, every, year, uh, every year I sign my calendar. And then I, uh, I think it's a good incentive for people to pre-order the book, you know, because it's just that nice little extra, so hand signed. Uh, but the time it takes, you know, there was delays in my shipping by a couple of weeks because I underestimated um, how many it would sell and how long it would take to take the book out of the box, open it, sign it, repackage it, and that whole process is is tricky. And you can tell if anyone who's bought a signed book. You know, there's, there's some books that have great signatures. They're usually, you know, 10 in the morning, starting the day. <laughs> and then at 5 p.m., there's some that's literally just a... <laughs> just <laughs> God, get out! I'm starting to resent people buying my book. <laughs> Take it. How important was producing a book to you? And, oh, and... God, the, well, so important. So important. Because it's just... It's the end. It's the end product of the life's work in a way because yeah okay you take the image you process the image you share the image online and then you can print the image as a print and that is incredibly satisfying but to have a collection of all prints which essentially is what the book is um is it's a body of work and what excites me the most is that it'll be around forever right you know it's it's there is a copy in the british library or there will be when i send it to them um and that's, you know, it's there forever. And each image has a story. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's just so... It's a, it's a lifelong dream, to be honest. I think it is for most photographers to yeah. have a published book of some sort. Uh, 
I mean, I've always wanted to have a book now. I'm, I'm sat here with my head in my hands as the only one of us that hasn't published a book yeah, but yet. Yeah, you're, you're working on it, right? I am working on one. I am working on one. I've got one photograph for it now already. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon after another 20 years, I might have like six. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely working towards that. And, and it's strange because, I mean, getting to hang out with, with you guys over the last week and with Thor as well, there's been a real camaraderie, but there's been a real sort of it just felt like we were all on exactly the same page, really, in terms of what the landscape meant to us. We were very respectful to the landscape. We were very conscious about where we were stepping because of all the fragile moss. I mean, wherever possible, we were we were skirting around any fragile areas. You know, we weren't chasing dramatic light. We were we were really just... I do remember one chase of some dramatic light. Yeah. <laughs> That's just sometimes... You know, you can't help it. The, the, I challenge any photographer not to get excited. There was about one night when the light kicks up. Yeah, there was one. Okay, there was one night, and it lasted for a very short period of time. But the the amazing thing was, and it might be worth doing in the video here, is looking at that moment and getting the three three of us to submit a couple of photographs that we were shooting in that place at the same time and just how incredibly different they're all going to be. Because I know for a fact we're all just pointing our cameras in different directions, and I think that's sums up exactly what small intimate landscapes mean is that you can just point out those tiny little moments in a scene that just resonate with you yeah i um i also did a lot of drone photography on this trip which i never do yeah because the landscape is just fantastic it's very it. drone friendly it yeah. is but back home i mean we just have a lot of trees and, and mountains and stuff which is it's great for video but for photography i, I find it difficult so here it's been great just to get the drone out and open spaces so you're not going to crash it, you know. Yeah, I'll admit to being a bit of a snob when it comes to drone photography and I never really saw it as anything I'd be interested in because I don't see it as real photography until this trip. Right. And then, you know, kind of, I'm there talking on camera about how a Hasselblad film camera is the same as an X-T3 and it's not the camera, it's the photography, right? And, and it's the same with drones. It's Why true. not? And I suddenly realised that. So I flew my drone... Um, and see you guys all taking photos with your drone. So I give it a go. And before you know it, you're exploring the landscape with your drone and taking pictures. And I would say now technology has moved on so that the image quality is still nowhere near a proper camera, like a mirrorless or a DSLR. But it's, I mean, yeah, it's up there. What's our drone now? 48 megapixels? Uh, the drone I have, which is the Mavic Air, Air 2, 2, will shoot 48 megapixel RAW files. Now, do think it it does like a sensor shift? Okay, but I don't know. I'm just assuming because it's only got half inch sensor. And right. I'm pretty sure it's not a 48 megapixel sensor, so it'll be 12, 20. Yeah, it'll be 12 megapixel sensor, and it'll shift. The okay. Sensor. Um, so technology, man. Oh, but it was great, and I got images. Sadly, that are probably better from the drone than <laughs> from my other cameras <laughs> because it just gets you to places you couldn't possibly be. Yeah, you know, and and there's almost as if it's. I mean, I, I, I've been shooting a lot with my drone as well on this trip, and there's something about that kind of pure exploration of a landscape because it's it's literally like you have never seen it before. You know, we were in a campsite for two or three days, and all of a sudden you stick a drone up, and it's just like, God, there's a river over there. You yeah. know, and you, you suddenly realise that you're surrounded by all these incredible graphic patterns and stuff. The only downside is you don't experience it with your eyes. So you're looking through a phone now if... If you could strap yourself to the drum and then you know, <laughs> another level, but you know it's the next best thing. It's, it's good fun, you know. You mustn't forget that photography is fun, and there's no better than whizzing a drone around the place. We talked images. about this during the trip, you know, because it's something that's. I mean, I did a video a few weeks ago, how to be a happy photographer, and there's all these barriers between where we are most of the time and being happy, uh, because I, for one, started in landscape photography to be happy, and for many years I wasn't, you know, and w did you go through that phase, Adam? Uh, well, when I was work working full time as a um, gun photographer, it got a bit mundane. I don't know if I was... That's kind of different, I think, because yeah. you were on assignments and things like uh, that. I, because I separated the two, I had my landscape and nature photography, which was, was a hobby, and the, the gun photography was my bread and butter, so I... I really, I just enjoyed going out outdoors and hiking a lot. So mm. uh, I've always, I don't know, I've always really enjoyed. You've always been a happy photographer. 
Well, for a while there, I, I, I didn't take any photographs for a couple of years. Um, I got into running and, um, I, you know, I was going through a hard time, so I just couldn't get into it. So mm. I decided something else, took up something else for a while. I mean, I still took photographs for a living, but I, I just didn't do the nature photography very much at all. Tom, Adam, you're not strangers to each other. You've lived in a caravan for three weeks, going on your, going on your <laughs> road to hell road trip. Yeah, it was road to hell. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was amazing. The F four road trip project. Um, I think it was more than three weeks. It was more like three and a half weeks. Okay. Um, although I was over there for a month, but it was yeah, wow, wow. That you talk about hard work every single day, every sunrise, every sunset. Yeah, man, that was full on, but very rewarding. Very rewarding indeed. You think? Yeah, I mean, this has definitely been a different trip altogether. Be more relaxing <laughs> right of course i think the, pro the problem with the f4 thing was that we were different location every day and i, I had a really hard time finding photographs that i'd use it i mean i was so slow you guys are pretty slow to everything so um it takes me a while to get into things we should have recorded this yesterday but you only just turned up <laughs> <laughs> i think one of the one of the great advantages of landscape photography is to stay in one place um you know, if you go on a trip somewhere, say you have a, a week's holiday and you go on holiday and you take your camera, it can be tempting to try and knock out different locations every day and travel and explore as much as possible. And whilst that is fun, uh, it could be a huge benefit just to stay in one place just for two days, you know, three days, get to know. And that's what we did on this trip. Yeah. We, uh, we started off going from location to location and then we all realized after two days now we need to just stop and set up camp somewhere and stay. And that's what we did. And we got rewarded with that amazing ash storm. Yeah. It's like a sandstorm, but it was all ash. As evidenced by Thomas Heaton's ear. Yeah, I'm still dirty. <laughs> my, my cameras need to go off for service when I get home. They just, they, they seem to suck in all of that ash. So yeah. Mine was between my toes, like on my, my, my <laughs> bed, all, 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 all black as sand. <laughs> no, it's pretty bad. It's, uh, I think I'm going to get sort of hosed down when I get home tomorrow. With COVID, you know, obviously, we all started the year with all of these. Uh, you have, I mean, we have our years planned out sometimes two years in advance. You know, I, I knew where I was going to be, you know, this time next year and almost the, the year after. Um, and we've suddenly found ourselves with all this time. Now, all three of us have YouTube channels, and I think that's become quite a focus. But how has this changed your vision of the business moving forward? It, it, you know, where are you at with this? Mm, yeah, well, it has changed the industry massively because nobody is really running workshops anymore. Every photographer I know has had their year cancelled, including myself. But, oh, and you, yeah, and Adam, yeah, <laughs> crazy. But I, um, I'm very lucky in that I have other means of revenue. Uh, I don't just rely on one source of income. So actually, for me, um, the whole situation of travel essentially being banned um, has been a blessing in disguise. Now, I'm not saying COVID is a blessing. Of, mm, course, of course, serious. Not. Lots of people have, have had their lives destroyed by it. Um, but in terms of being told, being forced into having a break, because it, it's been invaluable. I, I've been saying for a long time that I need to just have six months off. I need to just not do anything for six months and get caught up on everything, that I've, you know, other projects that I've been meaning to do. And I was forced into that situation. And at first, I was a bit panicky. I thought I was going to lose everything. And it was, oh, God, it was a disaster. And then, you know, I had three, four or five workshops, trips, whatever, cancelled. And I was able to then bring forward projects that have been on the back burner for so long and basically tidy up all these loose ends. Like my book, I've been writing my book for nearly two years and I could never really see myself getting it finished because I think, well, when am I going to launch it? Because I'm mm. on this trip for a month and then I'm away for a month here and then and all that cancelled. So, like, right, great, I'll do my book. And it's like, oh, we can edit the F4 road trip, which is the, the, you know an online tutorial, which requires a lot of editing and a lot of filming um, processing tutorials. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we would, would have heard we, about it. It would have been another year at least. Yeah. And it would have probably suffered because it would have been done in bits and pieces because our schedules were all different yeah and all of a sudden the f4 guys our schedules are suddenly gone so we can all work as a team at the same time rather than nick is away so i'm doing a bit and then i'm away so gavin's doing a bit and 
so on and so I couldn't on. believe how much effort you put into that. I mean, I was I speak to Adam more more than the other three of you, but you know, every time I spoke to you, you were just absolutely swamped with the amount of work that was required, the editing particularly, because you I mean you edited all yourself. It wasn't as if you were getting in, you know, professional video editors to do it. Yeah, there were some things that were, um, you know, like Nick and Gavin are the sound guys, so they'd get a bit bent out of shape if the sound wasn't good or so. I mean, with that, some of it was a bit of a challenge, kind of trying to stay friendly with one another. <laughs> but actually, it, that's, that's why I'm here with you two instead. Uh, no, I, I mean, it turned, out, it turned out great. I mean, I was really surprised to like, we're still, still friends, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just, no, I think if we were to do it again, um, I would hire editors to edit yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'd probably hire a producer to come on the road with us, and the producer would organise everything, hotels, food, this, that, and the other. Because, man, we did everything, and it was hard, and it really stretched our friendships. Uh, but I'm really proud of the product. It's an incredible product. It really is. Um, you know, it's it's online. It's photography learning, but with edu- uh, entertainment and inspiration it's just a full package i'm really proud of it and i don't think anything like that has been done in the past yeah i can't see how it could be replicated because <laughs> it's just insane some of the stuff we did yeah it was, it was good it was a lot of fun it was a huge amount of fun but yeah a huge amount of work as well so i think there's a great a great amount of value in that um so tomorrow we're all heading home yeah. I'm back to Scotland. You're back to the north of England, and Adam's got the longest yeah, journey back to Victoria, trip, yeah. Vancouver Island. I feel sorry for you, man. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's thinking of coming to Iceland, you might want to look into how many flights come here and where you're coming from, because it's not direct flights. Um, it's going to be a long trip home, and then of course, when I get home, I've got to uh, self-isolate for another two weeks. So you might want to think long and hard before you start packing your bag. Tom and I don't have to self-isolate, but I think I'm, I am going to. I, I generally, I'm not the most social person anyway, so um, I do. I mean, I've got so much editing to do. Yeah. And it's a great excuse for not having to go out and do all the chores. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, I think it's a sensible thing to do. Um, you know, seven days, if you've got no symptoms, then yeah. But, you know, I mean, Iceland's a very low-risk country. You know, statistically, the chance of picking up here is way well, more we, chance. We, we got home. tested. We got tested on arrival yeah. when we got here, and then we had to wait five to seven hours for our results to come through. And not until that point would Thor come and pick us up. No, he wouldn't, and I don't blame him. No, nope, absolutely, it's everyone's livelihood and safety is at, mm-hmm. at, at play. So I think it's important to kind of emphasize that we did this as safely and responsibly as we possibly could and also trying to help the Icelandic economy you know which has suffered the same as every other yeah. economy around the world so you know we, we have been super safe and we've really only been the four of us in our car the remote. entire time yeah we've been very remote areas so we've not going into contact with many other people apart from the odd um, petrol station where we've had to fill up yeah um but yeah, I mean, when I get home, it's just uh, it's a great excuse to sit down and work, edit, get through all the footage, get the film processed. Um, I think, to be honest, we have more chance of picking it up in the airport when we get back home than we have here. Yeah. yeah. I think there's 30 active cases or something in Iceland at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So what's the future hold for you, Mr. Gibbs? Well, um, i probably take a, a, a more of a, a home direction because um, I'm not totally optimistic about next year either and uh, I think uh, I will be doing more uh, videos and just continuing what I'm doing now I, I, I'm hoping to put together another book if I get my act together great but uh, yeah actually I, I the workshops as much as um, I'm disappointed I don't really miss them to be honest with you I uh... <laughs> <I'm> great <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> I, um, That's the soundtrack of all my videos. <laughs> it's my tummy crumbling. I, uh, I mean, I had a lot of traveling for this year, but I'm not really that bothered, to be honest with you. I mean, it's been great to come here. But I live in a nice place in the earth, on the earth. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm lucky that the UK is very diverse in terms of landscapes um, and quite small, so everywhere is accessible. Uh, I'm like Adam. I was optimistic about next year, but now I'm not. After seeing just after seeing what's happened in Iceland over a week and yeah. how fast things change, 
Um, so I'm not overly optimistic. Um, so yeah, I'll be very much focusing on the UK. I mean, I love to travel. I really do. You've got a new van coming. New van. So that's, yeah, that's the UK. Big time. You both got the same. You will both yeah, have we'll the same van. The Mitsubishi Delica Club. Yeah. Delicia. <laughs> Adam has the better one, which is the, um, the, um, the Mark 1 L400. Whereas mine's the Mark 2. I say Mark 2, it's the same facelift. But yours is better. Yours is the icon. Mine's, mine's slightly yeah, different. Mine's collector's edition. <laughs> I couldn't get one of yours, so <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's I'll exciting. Sorry, <laughs> I also want to use the time wisely if I'm not traveling. You know, like Adam said, he's writing another book. Um, I'd love to start writing another book. I don't have enough material to produce a second book right now, but I could certainly start, and then maybe this time next year I will have enough material. I noticed a huge change of your photography through the book. Well, it's, actually, it's on purpose. If you uh, if you open the book and look at it, it starts off in the mountains, and then you end up at the ground that you're standing on. Mm. So you go from the mountains down through the forests or whatever to the open deserts, the sea, um, and then you end up at the ground. Yeah. So there's this is transition from high mountains to basically, you know, this bigger scene. That's yeah. the most profound you've been in the entire week. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't just a random collection of images. No, actually, it's not. There is a flow to it. I don't think I made it clear in the book. I didn't really want to. Right. Um, but there is a natural progression. Like the first image is, is taken in um, in Nepal. Um, Gokyo. Gokyo, yeah. So the first image is Gokyo in Nepal, I think, or Chamonix. One of the two, anyways, first or second. I think it's Gokyo. Yeah, and then the last image is literally a pile of leaves on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, it's good. I've really enjoyed the trip. I mean, it's just been awesome. I mean, it, it's. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a bit like Tom, is that I tend to keep myself to myself. And I, you know, I mean, I lived in China and Tibet. And we've been joking this week, is that you know I've lived everywhere. But you know, most of the time I was away. You know, I wasn't mixing with other people, and you become very insular. And you know, even though you and I have been great friends for so long, it's always been kind of remote. We've only met two or three times before this. Twice. And yeah. Twice, yeah. And then Tom we've only met in the last month. Um, but just hanging out with like-minded people without the pressures of work and it's, I don't know, it's been a really relaxing thing for me. It's the same for me at home. I mean, I, I have very few friends. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't, well, I mean, it doesn't bother me, um, but I have very few people that I go actually take photographs with, very select few, because it, I find it, it kind of detracts me from what I want to do. I mean, my, you know, my partner Karen and I, we go away all the time, but, um, you know, I hang out with Gavin a little bit, but even with Gavin, I mean, I, I, you know, I really enjoy spending time with Gavin, but I couldn't spend all my t photographic time with him because it would just be too distracting. Mm. And then I have a friend, uh, Jeremy, that I go away with now and then, but that's it, you know. Um, I just go and do my own thing. I just find it so much more. I can just focus. I have a hard time focusing on a lot of things. So autumn's just around the corner. Mm -hmm. Is, how do I mean? We we've, we've talked loosely about getting together in the in the autumn and yeah, I mean autumn's just like the bountiful season for the landscape photographer. If you get a good autumn, you can get bad autumns in the UK, and that's always depressing. But yeah, I mean, my every year I'll do an autumn trip where I'll go away in the van for a week or so. You know, basically I shoot more in the autumn than I do any other time of year because it's such a short period and it's so beautiful. You just got to try and make hay while the sun shines, you know? So, yeah, I'll, I'll probably try and follow the autumn south. So start off in Scotland, have maybe a week in Scotland and then go down the Lake District and the Peak District and from there, yes. Yeah, so. Do you guys get nice colour in the fall? Yeah. Yes. Scotland, Scotland's great. Sometimes, yeah. though, what can happen is you can get... It all depends on... Shift in temperature, I think. I guess if it's been really dry, then yeah. the leaves just fall off. Yeah, if it's been, if also if it's been mild, wet, and windy, they don't turn that much. They tend to just beech trees drop hold off. their leaves in Scotland Weird. right through into December. Mm -hmm. The young ones will keep their leaves all all year. Yeah, yeah. The the younger trees will keep their leaves all winter. Um, there's a term for it, which I'm sure someone will correct me about. The, the old ones lose their leaves and the young ones keep them, which is why you'll find a, a stand of beech with all these orange leaves, even in the heart of winter. Uh, so, yeah, in, in Scotland, in particular parts of Scotland, you can go shooting in December and you'll definitely still have autumn colour. Yeah. So it's, I think the problem is the weather's 
you know, you very rarely get those crisp autumnal days. It's normally just wind and rain, or it can be. Where I live. <laughs> uh, it's, it's tough. Whereas you go somewhere like Colorado, yeah. then the weather's much more predictable and you get those crisp, clear days and the yellow aspen. I don't think we'll be doing that this year. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's been a jolly jape through Iceland over the last 10 days. I've, like I said, I'd like to thank you both for a highly enjoyable trip and obviously Thor for his... Yeah, thank you too for coming. Yeah, yeah. it was awesome. It was awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be chatting again in the future. Maybe. <laughs> not, not after this trip. <laughs> I'm done, man. <laughs> That's right. I hate you guys. <laughs> well, I think it's fair to say that we were playing a pool championship last night. Yeah. And yeah, I suck. so far, Thomas Heaton has turned into a bit of a rogue, a bit of a shark. I was just playing pool, man. Can't help it if no one can get me off the table. I practiced for an hour and a half this morning while those two were still working. What? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, been, I've been in there. <laughs> well, I haven't played for 13 years, so I need to get my arm back in shape. Well, I haven't played for... Well, I can't remember the last time I played. So. That, that was quite clear. And even, <laughs> and even then, I don't think I was playing. It was just knocking the ball around. <laughs> So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I know it's just been a bit of uh, a bit of a rant with us sitting around and chatting. Uh, we've been doing this for ten days, and I'm sure if we'd f filmed more of our conversations, we might have ended up with either something that couldn't have been shown on YouTube. Yeah, not advertiser friendly. <laughs> not advertiser friendly. But uh, I'd like to thank Tom and Adam for a inviting me to come on this trip, and secondly for agreeing to sitting here in a hotel lobby uh, with lots of people walking past carrying trash cans. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching as normal. Check out Thomas Heaton, uh, his wonderful channel, which is incredibly instructive and educational, and what would you say? What well, just inspirational? Yeah, inspirational. Adam, of course, we know very well with his quiet light and his Mister Grumpy. Uh, attitudes and you don't want to watch mine oh wait a minute you are watching mine <laughs> thanks everyone thanks tom thanks adam right, Jack. cheers <laughs>